Okay, so I think that we have seen quite a few things around uh, reactive programming, uh, quite in deep, thankfully to the other speakers. Uh, what I'm trying to do today is uh, uh, an exercise with you, and uh, basically uh, I would like to drive you uh, around uh, the evolution of architectures, starting from 80s and arriving to uh, 2016, uh, in 40 minutes. That's the, the interesting part. So my name is Luca, I'm Solution Architect in Massive Interactive, a company uh, that is based in London, Sydney, um, Prague and New York. Um, I'm Community Manager of the London JavaScript User Group, so if you are in London, um, any day just check on meetup.com and if you find any event, are all free, so just bump up. Um, what we are going to cover today is uh, basically the, the history of front-end architectures because I think it's very um, educative and also can uh, I like to learn from my mistakes, so I want to, uh, to understand what's going on uh, in the previous architectures and see how we can evolve them. Um, we will talk about uh, uh, communicating sequential processes. That is a concept that on front end is not um, leveraged so much, but is, uh, I think, interesting because uh, uh, in a certain way, understanding CSP leads you to understand better reactive programming. Uh, we will talk about transducers, we will talk about reactive programming, and at the end, uh, we will talk about MVI, so model view intent. Uh, let's start with uh, some history. Uh, let's start uh, about talking about architectures. So, in the 80s, I think everyone uh, worked at least once, probably not in the 80s, but also nowadays, with MVC, so Model View Control. Uh, as you know, Model View Control has uh, um, a model where we store the data, the view where we are rendering the uh, output, and the controller that is controlling these two other objects. Uh, it could be uh, implemented in different flavors. Uh, it could be that uh, the model doesn't know anything about the view, and vice versa, uh, and the controller controls uh, both uh, objects, or otherwise there are uh, other implementation in um, other programming languages where uh, the controller is just uh, saying, okay, there is something to update and the view has a direct connection with the model so and retrieve this information directly from the model. These are the two things that we are quite used, I think, at least one of these two flavors of MVC uh, to work with uh, till now, because I think that um, at least once you work with MVC. After MVC in the 90s, um, it um, came out a new paradigm uh, called MVP. Is model view presenter, and uh, in this case uh, there is a slightly difference. So we have again model in view, and uh, again model is uh, storing the data, and view is rendering the output. Uh, but the presentation model is something different, and it's something uh, that personally is one of my favorite architecture because, in particular, when you work with cross-platform application, uh, these allow you to be very flexible and uh, uh, swap views when you want. And in particular, because the presentation model, basically, it's not the real controller, so uh, the presentation model has a correlation one-to-one -one with the view. So the view and presentation model is always connected one-to-one. -one. Uh, and the view are uh, called passive views. So basically, the views are dump views that are just rendering stuff. That's it. And the presentation model knows when there is an interaction, knows uh, what kind of data uh, it, ne it needs in order to populate the views. And uh, in this case, as you can understand, having a, a dump view will allow you, if you use, uh, I don't know, a tool like Babel or, um, I don't know, other, other um, compilers, because there's plenty out, out there of uh, compilers, um, to swap the views uh, at transpile time or compile time. It's up to you. And that means potentially you can have, for instance, um, if you work in a cross-platform application, um, you have some views that are dedicated only on mobile, some others that are dedicated only on web, and maybe some others that are dedicated only on smart TV. Um, mod MVP, I think, is a very flexible one. It was uh, really, really used on the time of uh, ActuScript. I came from that background. Uh, I work on a lot of um, projects with ActuScript on several devices and that is an architecture that really really helps you uh, to get to reuse the majority of the code and uh, and just change the views when when you need it in particular because when you fix an issue on a presentation model the presentation model is shared across all the applications and the only thing that you are going to to, uh, to change is the view 
Another thing that, um, another evolution of uh, architecture was made by Microsoft uh, in 2005, and it's called MVVM, so Model View View Model. In that case, what we have is, uh, uh, again, model and view that I, uh, I think that we understood what, what they are, but we have the view model that is slightly different. So the view model, um, in this case, the view is, uh, let's say, a slightly more um, clever than uh, smart than before. So in this case, the view uh, has, when we want, for instance, uh, we want to update a value, we use a binding system between the view model and, and the view. And the view model is called supervisor controller, uh, if you want. Um, and basically, uh, what it's doing is updating the view. Uh, the correlation is not one to one like, um, uh, like the uh, MVP. So between the view model, uh, the view model could handle multiple views uh, and is not even a controller because it's storing also some data that are used to populate the view. So this is another flavor and uh, I think um, uh, in JavaScript, if you work with JavaScript, was um, very used in Knockout.js. For instance, Knockout is based on uh, MVVM. Um, then in 2009, the creator of uh, MVC said, uh, okay, it's been a while that they don't create a new architecture and probably the world changed. And it's true, DCI is uh, basically one of the most famous lean architecture that you can find, um, on, let's say, it's the most famous architecture you can find on the lean environment. And DCI stands for Data Context Interaction. And the cool part of uh, DCI is uh, basically that um, you describe what the system is, you describe what the system does, and basically you take these two information in order to create some scenarios. DCI is uh, one of the architecture uh, that is um, um, quite famous also in uh, domain-driven design uh, because it's mapping the business requirement with the directly with the architecture. If you think uh, to um, model view control, for instance, uh, it's not a natural way. So you have to map every time the business requirement in, okay, I'm storing the data in the model, and this is my view, and the controller should handle these things. In DCI, you have data that obviously are represented by D, so data. Uh, you have uh, context that is basically the scenario that you want to create and interaction. So you have the actors there that are interacting together in order to accomplish one thing. So if you think, for instance, uh, to um, create with DCI, uh, um, let's say simulate um, um, a bank account payment, uh, what you can do is having in the scenarios so of the context, uh, your context in that case is make, make a transfer. Uh, and, um, and then what you have as actors, you have the bank, your bank account in particular, uh, and you have the, the bank account of the person that you have to transfer this money. And the data are basically the bank. So you check inside the data if your account has enough money in order to transfer this uh, to, um, to the other bank account. Um, and then you describe all these things so uh, inside your context. And this, it's, it's very interesting because uh, uh, it's a different approach from, from the others where are more machine-based, if you want, and, are, uh, and are more, it's more focused on what the business requirements are in this case. And then in 2017, we have Flux. Uh, Flux, uh, as you know, is uh, the, um, let's say, it's the architecture that uh, you can use when, uh, uh, when you work with, with React. Um, but it's also a design pattern. Uh, if you check the Facebook documentation, Flux is um, basically leveraging the idea of unidirectional flow. So you start from one point and you always, in order to update the entire application, you always go uh, in, in that direction. And that brings up uh, an interesting concept, in particular if you have, if you're working with large teams uh, that a new person joined the, the, the team and immediately is productive because you spotted immediately where a bug is because if it's dispatched uh, an event from or an action from uh, one place, you immediately know where it is. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you have to create a new feature, you know that you have always to, to follow the same, the same flow. So in that case, uh, I think is um, uh, a nice way to, to handle this. And then in 2015, we have finally model view intent. We will see that more in deep 
in a couple of slides. Uh, MVI is basically the first architecture that uh, is trying to solve the problem. Okay, we know reactive programming now. We are trying to use reactive programming. Let's try to figure out if there is an architecture that can fit the reactive programming concept inside in a nice way that allow us to uh, take the um, powerful observables uh, in consideration and use them in order to structure the entire application. So the commonality of this uh, architecture uh, is they are trying to, to stick with the solid principles. Um, they try to encapsulate the data, data in, in a certain way. They are trying to be loose coupled, but at the same time, uh, they, they have to, to communicate together. And uh, in order to do that, they use um, events mainly. You can use, um, uh, but the main, the main challenge on working in event-driven architectures is understanding where the flow is. And in particular, if you, are, if you have a large application, uh, then one the problem that you have uh, is where the event is bubbling and understanding uh, uh, if, you don't, uh, if you don't stick with, uh, with the rules of your architecture is, and you are not consistent with your architecture is understanding where the things are going. And in particular, with even driven architecture, you risk to lose the point and create bugs that are uh, not useful for your application. You can communicate between objects in several ways. You can have events that are based on, on strings. You can have signals that is slightly better because you use uh, object uh, instead of uh, strings. Um, you can use uh, pub sub, a pub sub system, or you can use an action dispatcher where, where how we have seen in, uh, um, in Flux. So the question is, are there any other way to communicate between objects, maintaining the same concept and trying to figure out if we can move a little bit forward uh, with our architecture. Uh, so I spent some time with CSP, um, and uh, basically what is communicating uh, sequential processes is um, um, a system that allows us to decouple completely two objects. Uh, could be like, uh, let's, let's assume mo mode of view control, um, we want to communicate between our controller and our, and our view. And uh, instead of having events, we are using a channel. So we are using a third object that is injecting inside both elements, inside both objects, uh, that allow us to communicate each other. And we will see in a moment an example. Uh, CSP is, is, is misleading because CSP means communicating sequential processes, but could be also parallel processes. Um, it it's not a new concept. It's created in 1978. Uh, so there is for JavaScript uh, uh, CSPJS, that is my favorite implementation currently. Uh, CSPJS is basically a porting of uh, closure uh, and uh, the coroutines. Um, and they are bringing this concept inside the JavaScript community. Um, it's trying to flavor composition over inheritance as very powerful thing also because in, in JavaScript, if you work properly with JavaScript, these concepts are um, um, well used and well known. Uh, this one is, let's say, it flavors in, in another way, it's, uh, it's pushing the concept of using composition or inheritance. It's way easier to test because uh, basically, as we have seen before with observables and the other great speakers that uh, show us how to create uh, testable code, um, Having a dependency injection in the constructor allow us to mock the object that we are going to, to inject. And that means potentially that we can create our test and test each single scenario that are uh, using inside my class. Um, it's loose, uh, loose coupled, it's obviously well encapsulated, and the most important thing, in particular when you work on cross-platform application, is trying to have clean code that is reusable and, um, and I can port in different, in different devices. So this is the concept that I was saying. Independently from uh, your architecture th that you are picking and you are choosing, uh, what you can have, so the point of contact between the view and your presentation uh, model, your controller, whatever, is the channel. So it's uh, another object that is injected between these two. Uh, and uh, basically, the communication come across the channel. And we will see why the channel is so powerful. Uh, let's start with something something simple. I prepare a few demos uh, here. 
so let's go here. OK, so this one is a bingo system. Uh, I don't know if uh, you, it's like Tombola. I don't know here in Switzerland if it's more famous Bingo or Tombola, or nor. Um, so basically, I have two tickets that are my two arrays here. And then I have uh, uh, um, an engine that is uh, basically calling some numbers. OK? So every time that a, a number called by the engine uh, is uh, present in one of the tickets, I say, oh, got number 37 in ticket T1. That is the ID of my ticket. Uh, and this is the classic asynchronous application, because usually the, these data are pushed from the server uh, to, to the client. And the client, uh, obviously, I work in, in gambling games, so that's why I'm, I'm uh, talking about this. <laughs> so basically, we all the, the, the fake engine that I created in JavaScript locally um, is usually is pushing, from a uh, uh, pushing data from a server uh, to the client, and the client is rendering this information uh, every few seconds, uh, more or less with the same cadence that you can find here. Uh, and then at the end, when, the, when the, the game is finished, you can see how many numbers you, have, uh, you, can, you can find inside your ticket, and you can win, win a prize. Um, so in order to check what I have done, let's start from here. So the application is super simple. I didn't create fancy architecture just to keep it simple. Uh, so what I have here is this. So we have, uh, uh, first of all, um, we create the channels. That is the object that I showed you before, uh, that is in the middle between the view and the controller or the model. It depends which architecture you're using. So I create uh, a both, ch both call channel, that is our, my engine. And then I create two tickets, one per channel. Uh, sorry, one cha uh, each, each ticket, one channel. Uh, and then what I'm doing here, because as you can see, the, uh, the channel I can do some operation, like what I can do with observables, some operation we saw before, um, map, scan, um, uh, flat map, and whatever. I can do the same thing on, uh, on with the channel. So basically, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm saying, oh, you know what? The channel is not communicating, the, my engine is not communicating only between one object to another one, but is broadcasting this information to several channels. So what I'm doing here is basically taking three channels that are completely free independent object and saying one is broadcasting very values uh, um, to other two channels. And if you can start to think about that, it means that potentially I can also decouple this and one day say, OK, only one channel is listening to that, uh, to that event. Or I can add a new ticket that is subscribed to the same channel. Um, and as you can see, it's not that far away from reactive programming. So the other, the, the last part, last bit is creating the concrete object, so the tickets uh, with uh, each single channel and the both system. The both system is basically um, a super simple application uh, that does that. So um, I have a total, total cost of 40 numbers. So inside my application, I call 40 times uh, um, a random number. Uh, that is a unique number that is generated by this, this function. And here, uh, I have uh, the, the, the magic of, um, of the channels. So basically, what I'm doing is retrieving the, the value from, the, from uh, my array that was created with all the values. Uh, and then here, I'm putting asynchronously inside the channel the value that I dispatch. Because in, in my hub, I basically, whoops, um, I basically use operation.mult, so I broadcasting not to only one uh, channel, uh, only one channel, but to several channels this information. Um, basically, every time that I dispatch something inside the uh, uh, bold call channel, automatically will be dispatched inside ticket one and ticket two. The last bit that I want to show you, uh, yeah, at the end when I arrive to over 40 elements, I basically stop the interval and I stop the game. In ticket, well, what I have, I, saw, I, told, uh, I said before that uh, I am, uh, CSP is working with GoRoutine. And we have here uh, the, the example. So we have csp.go. And inside here, as you can see, I'm describing what's happening. So every time that uh, a channel is, is called, uh, sorry, I inserted a data inside the channel, um, basically, uh, I'm. Um, Retrieving this this uh, um, value inside the, the generator and uh, and pushing inside the console here. Every time that I find something that is present, my my ticket because the ticket is creating for itself 
some 15 unique numbers. Um, I'm checking this and say, oh yes, if there is uh, this value inside my ticket, I have uh, to to, uh, to write inside the console, console log got number and blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, uh, when it, this finish, as you can see, I'm closing the channel. And uh, we use generators that is a new ECMA 6 uh, feature, mainly because we can stop the execution of uh, the function and resume when we want with, with Yeld. Uh, it's something that you can find if you ever work with Lua, for instance, you can find also there. So it's not something, uh, let's say, an, another new concept that uh, uh, JavaScript brings up. Um, as you can see here, here the, the, the different objects, like the ticket, the ball code system, they don't know each other at all. The only point of contact is a channel. There isn't anything that is bubbling inside an application. There is only one object that is injected, and uh, through the, this operation here, I'm basically broadcasting events across my application. So the moment that I want to move this boss code system instead of ticket with something else, I can do it easily. It's super easy because I have just to change this. I don't have to touch anything else. If I want to change the mechanic of my game and say, oh, you know what? Um, the user, uh, instead of, um, I don't know, both during the game other 10 tickets, because it's doable, I can just add more channels and more tickets to my application. And I know exactly what's, what's happening inside there. This is a very simple application. Um, let's move on for a moment here. Let me stop this. Uh, OK, so go ahead with the presentation. So what I can do with CSP? So CSP allow me to create a buffer inside my channel. So saying, for instance, I want just that inside my channel there are always three elements, and I pick only always these three uh, elements. Uh, I can put a value inside the channel. I can retrieve a value from the channel. I can close the channel, or I can close the channel after a while. Uh, I can uh, put an array inside the channel and automatically. This one is taking. Uh, um, value by value, and then I can, um, uh, I don't know, split my, my channel, merge channels, pipe the channels. So as you can see, I have, with these operators, I have a flexibility that allow me to, to do whatever I want without having events that are bubbling around my application. And another cool p thing is, um, if I really, 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 really need um, something that just notify inside my application uh, instead of passing values, but just notifying that something happened, I can have the pub sub system that basically is an observer pattern. Uh, we will see that more in deep in, in a bit. Um, the other cool thing is that I can broadcast values simultaneously. I, um, I can, again, and this is the most interesting part, I can use these guys, transducer, uh, that are used also uh, in RxJS. Um, basically, a transducer is uh, as a composable, uh, it's composable argument transformation is what Wikipedia suggests. But OK, let's take it simple. So transducer are two words, transform and reduce. OK? So transform, I'm producing some value from another. And reduce, I'm combining values in order to have a unique value. So what I can have here is basically the same example that I had before, but I can apply some operation inside the channel. So the channel is not anymore an object that is used in order to pass values across different uh, uh, element, but it could be something more. So let's take a look to this example here. Uh, and as, let's assume for a moment, OK, so it should be fine. Let me see if triggers an error. I don't think so. OK, cool. So stocks application. So I have, uh, for instance, let's assume that um, uh, by default, um, the stock applications are um, um, has, has defo default value dollars. But we want to, to let's say, agevolate our users and create a dashboard that automatically convert uh, with the current value of the currency, uh, the dollars value to, to a local uh, currency. So for instance, in this case, I'm, uses, I'm using pounds. Uh, and what I'm doing is basically having in my model a value that um, contain uh, uh, the, the, the stock value in dollars. And I change it. But where I'm going to change it? I could change on the view. I can change on the controller. I can change more or less. I saw so many implementation of this. I could even have 
these things on my model, but do I really need them? So I would say no. So what I'm, uh, I would like to show you in the next example is this. What about using a channel to do that? So this is my application. Again, I have one model. I have uh, 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 my view that is rendering stuff. Uh, my model that has all the data inside um, itself with, uh, with dollars. And what I'm doing inside the channel, this is a transducer, basically I'm, uh, what I'm decorating my data, adding some information that could be useful for, for several things. So in this case, I create a base class, and uh, then I, I, through, I extend through inheritance, I change the, this value of, um, of the base channel, adding the currency value, the buffer, and the actual currency that I want to use. And what the transducer is doing is every time that uh, there is an, uh, an object dispatch, uh, sorry, a value in dispatch inside the channel, I'm returning instead an object with some values decorated. And the interesting part here is, uh, for instance, I have, uh, in this case, the euro channel. If I want to change to that one, I have the pound channel and whatever. And when I want to change it, um, I just need to go to my content that is wiring up everything. I change, in this case, as you can see, I'm using the Euro channel, same model, same view. I didn't touch anything else. I go here, I run my stuff, I go back here, it's reloading, and if everything is right, now we have Euro. What I did here is basically just injecting, so using, Euro channel. I didn't do anything. The data inside my model are pure, are exactly the same data that I'm receiving from the, from the server. Are, I didn't have to manipulate them because this thing is only one thing that I need in order to agevolate the user experience, and that's it. It's not something that I have to store, and it's not something that shouldn't be handled by the controller at all. So in this case, what I'm doing is having this third object that is used to communicate between uh, the, the, the channels and saying, okay, well, every time that uh, an element hit, um, an element is inside you, I'm want to, I want to transform it. I can also reduce it, like for instance, every time that I inject uh, an array of value, I sum all the value and I just have the total on, on, the, on the view. So as you can see, here is an imperative way to work with, uh, uh, with, with a sort of observables, but it's very, let's say, um, imperative, uh, as I said. It's not functional like, um, uh, like the reactive programming implementation. Um, let's move on for a moment. And let me close this server here and go back here. OK, so this leads to reactive programming. So we have seen CSP that basically is this channel between two objects. And let's take a look at what uh, reactive programming is. But first, let's keep in mind that we have several types of paradigms that we can use in programming. The thing that we have seen before with channels is imperative programming. So basically, I'm describing step by step what's going on inside my application. Then we have functional, but let's move quicker to reactive programming. So what's going on inside the reactive programming? In reactive programming, basically, um, uh, what I'm doing is uh, try to um, react to changes that are propagated through a certain amount of time and dealing with data flow. Why reactive programming is becoming so, so interesting? There were some specs that I discovered yesterday, unfortunately, that were drop off on ES7. Uh, there were uh, from gu some guys from Netflix. Uh, I don't know if Ben is here. Uh, probably not. Uh, but um, that suggests uh, um, to, to the um, uh, consortium to use uh, observables natively inside uh, um, JavaScript. But unfortunately, after the second stage, it was blocked, the specification. But we have Angular 2. Uh, we have seen a few great speakers that talk about that. We have another uh, small company based in Norway uh, called Fuse uh, that are using observables by default inside their application. Uh, and uh, basically, they are working uh, uh, in, a, in, a nice, uh, in a nice way because they are working with um, uh, um, C Sharp. Uh, and uh, and they're using observables in, also in, in order to wire the data flow between view and 
controller. And then we have several implementation of uh, reactive programming, so several libraries that are growing up. RxJS probably is the most famous one. It's used inside Angular, uh, and uh, there are so many implementation of RxJS currently. Uh, it's, it's becoming more or less a buzzword. There is CycleJS uh, that is um, made by one of the contributors of RxJS. And uh, CycleJS basically is the first one that is using MVI, so the architecture that I'm going to, to speak in uh, in a moment. And then we have uh, BaconJS, that is another one, uh, another library uh, for reactive programming. There is also uh, another um, library called Highland.js, but it's plenty currently. Um, and uh, it's an interesting moment if you want to jump in this, uh, in this paradigm. So, reactive programming is programming with a synchronous data stream. Um, and it's a simple definition, but let's try to understand what there is behind. Behind the reactive programming, we have two patterns that are implemented by default. So, the observer pattern, that I think, uh, uh, I hope that the majority of you is uh, familiar, where basically we have, um, there are several implementation of uh, um, observer pattern, obviously in JavaScript, um, pure JavaScript, let's say, uh, vanilla JavaScript, we don't have um, interfaces and um, generics and so on, uh, and abstract. Uh, but we have uh, basically what we can, uh, fetch from, from this uh, UML diagram is that we have um, a subject that I can subscribe to, uh, I can remove my subscription, and every time that something happens, I'm updated. Uh, I think that it sounds familiar of what we have seen before. And it's very interesting. Um, then, obviously, each single uh, subscribe that should have an update method, otherwise it can't react when, uh, when there is um, an event bubbling inside, uh, sorry, an event, a new state, uh, a new notification inside the, the, object, uh, the observer. We have the iterator pattern that is used to traverse a container. So in that case, uh, what we, we need to know is that we need next and has next uh, as method to iterate through uh, um, 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 a container. So in this case, next, for instance, is one of the methods that you can find inside the RxJS. Um, as next is just returning a Boolean value to understand if there is a value or not and understand when the, uh, my container is finished. So there aren't any other value to iterate with. And uh, let's try to see the same, uh, same uh, bingo system, but this time created with RxJS. So let's see that if it works first. So again, I have my two arrays. Uh, I have uh, my, my calls, and every time that I found uh, a value, I highlight that. So what's go let's assume, so we saw before how we implement that, and it's very uh, verbose. So let's see here what we have. So again, we have a bulk code system, that is our engine. We have uh, um, basically the, the ticket, um, and, and I create two tickets at the same time in this case. And then when I need it, because obviously we said observables are lazy, so every time that the user, uh, so sorry, an object is subscribing to that, so that observables, automatically start to um, share data with this, uh, this observer. But in this case, I need to wait that all observ observables are uh, available. So in that, that's why I created also this star game that is this object here. As you can see, it's way more easier to follow now the engine that I have created. So wha what I have here, I created, I generate the numbers again. I propose use exactly the same code. I change only what I need to do. So I, <coughs> I create an observable that every three milliseconds, three seconds, um, are dispatching an information. This information is retrieved uh, by my number calls that I generate all my values. And uh, after 40 calls, I stop, I close the observables. So it's very easy to follow right now compared to what we had before. Uh, let me open it. Where I have this monster here, uh, system. 
where I have to describe, okay, check if the number is the 40th number that you are dispatching inside the channel and so on and so forth. So as you can see, it's way more easier. Okay, we can compare also in this way. Following, uh, let me see if I can do this, perfect. Following this and following that. So here I have uh, my observable, and here I have the description, literally, of each single step that I'm doing. OK, so let's move back to our example here. OK, so what we have here is uh, our ball code system that is uh, basically uh, shouting some, uh, calling some uh, numbers uh, every time, every three milliseconds, and I have my ticket. Uh, basically, is uh, I'm exposing the uh, observable, and I'm taking it uh, in uh, through dependency injection, and I'm subscribed to this thing. And every time that I subscribe, basically, I every time that I receive any from uh, data, I call on data method, otherwise on error or on complete. Um, and here I'm doing, my, I'm performing my checkings. And also here, as you can see, it's very explicative what, what I'm doing. It's very easy to follow the, the flow of what I'm, uh, I'm doing compared to before. That I have uh, generators, that inside the generators I have to handle all the different things, errors, data, and when the uh, element is complete. So in this case, it's helping me how to, also how to, to create uh, and structure my application. Um, the other interesting thing of uh, reactive programming is that, uh, I don't know if, uh, because I wasn't in the band's um, talk, he talked about uh, hot and cold observables. Uh, but just to give you an example, let's assume that my user, instead of buying two tickets since the beginning of the application, is buying a second ticket after five seconds. Uh, oops. Uh, yes, it's this one. Okay, cool. So, as you can see here, I have one ticket, and after a while, I have the second ticket. Okay? Here, uh, let's focus a mo for a moment here. So, here I have the first four calls, five calls, sorry, uh, and then I buy a second ticket. And the second ticket, T2 is starting to receive data from 72, but in my case, in my application, I need that uh, the second ticket check also the previous values, because obviously it could happen that I have 23 and 14 in my second ticket, I could have a bingo, I can win a prize. So in this case, if I have to describe this in imperative way, it becomes really a madness because I start to write code and understand, okay, I have to uh, save in a buffer all the data and then I have to check every time this information when a new ticket is, is coming. Nothing like that in uh, reactive programming. So we can easily, oh, sorry. We can easily change this in this way. So, in this case, I have an auto observable instead of a code observable. The previously, I have a code observable. So, I start to, to dispatch information, the first observer that I'm doing, and I don't care, honestly, the previous information. Here, instead, what I have is a uh, hot observables. And when I run it, check this out. So, I have my first ticket. Then I start to have the second ticket. Okay, let's stop here. And the second ticket is doing, oops, I did mine. The second ticket is the first thing when subscribe that is doing is exactly checking all my values. And what I did here on my code, so I, I retrieve also the first five values here. And then it starts to work normally having 88 and checking on each ticket the, the value. What I'm doing here is basically uh, changing the replacing the, the my my ball code system with an instead of a code observable with an auto observable and the only difference I can show you like this okay so 
here I have start game, I call connect, so I, I, I wait, I stop basically, the, I prevent that uh, my observable start to um, call uh, numbers, and I call when I want it to connect to the observable and start to push data inside my stream. In this case, I said, I don't really care, I just had share replay that transform my hot uh, my code observable in a hot observable. So every time that the observer is subscribing to a hot observable, what he's doing is, OK, I need to retrieve all the data that were dispatched before. And that's the main difference. I can also set inside this share replay uh, a value to say, I don't need all the data since the beginning of the application. I need just the last five data. And this is super easy to do because I just need to do like, here, I don't know, two. In this case, uh, it contains a buffer, like we have seen before with CSP, uh, of two elements inside this, uh, this, this thing. So it, it contains only the last two elements that were called inside my uh, engine. And as you can see, I didn't change much. The code is exactly the same. The only thing that I changed is this. And that's it. OK, so let's stop this and move back to the presentation. How much time do we have? One minute. Perfect. <laughs> OK. Cool. So we talk about uh, how to structure the application. We talk evolution uh, of the architectures. So how we can create a pure function, uh, reactive programming, sorry, uh, um, a pure reactive architecture. This is the first attempt to, to solve uh, this problem. I can't say it's the definitive architecture because probably we will, currently there are other projects that are raising up um, quite quickly. Uh, these are, this is the, probably the most famous, that is the one um, implemented by, by CycleJS. Uh, here we have a model view intent where model view I don't want to describe again, but let's, let's take a look at what the intent is. So first of all, one thing that is important to, to notice is this uh, how these arrows are flowing. So as you can see, it's a triangle and it's unidirectional. You remember Flux? So again, we are bringing here one important thing. So that means with this architecture, we can have the benefit that Flux has in unidirectional flow. So quickly, I can understand where the problem is. How these guys are communicating each other? The only way to communicate between this object is through observables. So that means the view is basically exposing only observables to the intent. The intent has a, an observer that is subscribing to all the uh, observables exposed by the view, and in order to and prepare the data for the model. So what is the model obviously is storing, uh, storing the data, but what the intent has here is basically another observable that, uh, that communicates to the model to, an observer that I, to the observer that is inside the model, what are the data that are inserted by the user or the, the interaction that was by, uh, by the user, and then is updating the view and try to guess how this is updating the view through observables. So the only communication between these three elements is only observables. So it's, again, we are leveraging the, the, the idea that is becoming super easy to test, super easy to unplug one of these elements and change with something else. Because the only point of contact is not an event that you can't control, but is an observable that you can use to do whatever you want. The last bit that you have to be reminded with the um, model view intent is that um, the view is not rendering by itself the, the, the DOM, but is using the concept of virtual DOM. So it's the only thing that the view is doing is having preparing the, the, the virtual DOM for the render element that usually is a library that could be React, or it could be uh, other uh, libraries that are using the virtual DOM. Um, and um, that's it, I would say. <laughs> Considering <laughs> that the one I, I, have to be st I have to stop. Okay. Uh, so I know that is a lot of information in one go, and uh, it takes me a lot of time to understand uh, the concepts that the, there are behind the, the framework, because now we are uh, seeing uh, amazing things with Angular 2 and uh, amazing things with uh, other frameworks. But I think it's quite important to understand the base in order to evolve these things in something that is very useful uh, for, for everyone. That's, that's obviously my point of view. <laughs>